In 2006, the first volume of the Kingdom manga was published, and 14 years later, in 2020, it became the second best-selling manga of the year. Through his battles, his characters and his intrigues, Yasuhira Hara tells the story of the fighting kingdoms, the seven great kingdoms that battled for control of China for over 200 years. In this video, we retrace 700 years of Chinese history to understand how the Middle Kingdom came to be unified into a single empire. Around 900 BC, the Chinese world, that is, all the territories where Chinese culture, writing and rites had spread, was divided between a multitude of city palaces ruled by lords. These lords received their power from the king of the Zhou dynasty, who had succeeded in extending his influence over a large part of the Chinese world. In exchange for their lands, the lords provided the king with contingents of fighters and tributes. War is inseparable from this world, with nobles regularly going into battle alongside the king to plunder barbarians or rebel cities. And so, over time, Chinese culture extends to barbarians, whether through warfare or simply by assimilating them. Over time, new palace cities sprang up all over the world outside the Zhou Kingdom. Some of them, more powerful than the others, were able to extend their authority over the towns and barbarian chiefdoms surrounding them, transforming them from simple isolated cities into veritable capitals, organizing vast kingdoms around them. At the same time, the Zhou's influence was waning, their vassals were gaining autonomy, and lordships were becoming hereditary, and principalities richer and more powerful than those of the king himself were emerging. In 771 BC, the House of Zhou is forced to move its capital eastwards after the Quanrong. Nomadic barbarians from northwest China plunder its previous capital. The king's new capital remained an eminent religious center, but lost all its warlike power. The king thus received protection from other cities in order to survive, but this event greatly accelerated his decline. Finally, around 700 BC, the Chinese world found itself divided between at least 150 autonomous states, some far more powerful than others, and with many cultural disparities between them, since many had been influenced by the barbarians they assimilated. This period of disorder is known today as the Spring and Autumn period. The Spring and Autumn period is above all a time of progress, mainly in agriculture. Yields increased considerably with the modernization of irrigation and plowing, making it possible to feed an ever-growing population. Many states created their own currencies, but almost all were accepted throughout central China. This was also a period of great thinkers, with scholars spreading their teachings throughout China, going from class to class, and offering their services to those willing to accept them. In particular, it was during this period that Confucius propagated his way of thinking, a way of thinking that would later become central to Chinese history. During this period, China's central states safeguarded their cultural and religious unity and sought to avoid wars of conquest between them. Instead, they established a kind of courtly warfare resembling a tournament in which the use of violence remained moderate. A duality is thus created in the Chinese world. The small states in the center, respectful of ancient traditions, are indirectly opposed by the powerful peripheral states, which do not have the same respect for these rights. The best example is the southern state of Chu, which ignores the practices of courtly warfare and gives much less credence to religious traditions. He did not hesitate to embark on wars of conquest, 
in the course of which he annihilated his enemies. Other powerful states, more concerned with religious issues, preferred to avoid these wars of conquest as much as possible, so they imposed their domination on weaker states through oaths, placing small palace cities under the protection of larger states. Between 700 and 500 before Jesus Christ, the many states of northern China spent their time hindering the Chu Kingdom's desire to expand. The first kingdom to take on the role of protector of small palace cities was Qi, who in 667 was recognized as head of the Confederation of Eastern Cities and guardian of traditions, a role that enabled him to curb Chu's conquests. He was followed by Jin who, after inflicting defeat on Chu at the Battle of Chengpu in 632, established himself as protector of the cities of central China. This was followed by a 30-year period during which the states of Jin and Chu regularly clashed, ending with the Battle of Bi in 597, during which Chu prevailed. Jin became temporarily unable to oppose him effectively and the southern kingdom expanded further, gaining importance in the central Chinese provinces and forcing the Zheng state to ally with him. Jin took up arms again, however, and set up several alliances with the Lu, Wei, and Song states to thwart his enemy's advance. Tensions did not subside until 579, when a truce was signed between the two states. At the same time, a new power was rising in the east, the state of Wu, aided by Jin, rapidly gained power in the course of the 6th century BC. It managed to impose itself against the Qi and the Chu, even occupying their capital in 506. Wu was then threatened by his neighbor Yue, who crushed him in 473. At the end of this troubled period, the great Chinese states were weakened. This is particularly true of Jin and Chu, who have been at each other's throats for over a century. The first collapsed in 453, when the country's great aristocratic families clashed and three powerful states were born from its ashes, Zhao, Wei, and Han. King Zhou symbolically offered the title of Lord to the leaders of these new states in 403. Chu, for its part, is also weakened as much by its large noble families blocking the centralization of the country as by the wars. However, this long period of incessant conflict led to major revolutions in the military system. The kingdoms of Wu and Yue were the first to replace battle tanks with infantry because of the swamps running through their country, and Jin was also forced to raise infantry to fight barbarians in the mountains. The first peasant armies appeared during this period. At first, these armies numbered only a few tens of thousands of poorly armed and poorly trained men. But in the next period, that of the Warring Kingdoms, these armies became much more efficient, made up of corps of infantrymen specialized in their field, such as Archer or Spearman Corps, accompanied by cavalry that gradually erased the need for battle tanks while the number of men mobilized exploded, reaching several hundred thousand for the great military states. Chinese tradition records seven great states during the period of the Warring Kingdoms, Zhao, Wei, Han, Qi, Yan, Qin, and finally, Chu. We can add Yue to our story. It's a kingdom that has nothing to envy the others, and which has probably been sidelined in Chinese history because of its semi-barbarian origins. This period of the Warring Kingdoms was a continuation of the Spring and Autumn period, during which wars were incessant and chaos continued in China, while no state was really able to assert itself over the others. Be that as it may, 
The first half of this era unfolded to the disadvantage of the last small principalities in central China, almost all of which were swallowed up by the great kingdoms that surrounded them. At this moment, it's Wei that stands out in the Chinese world. In 354, after a series of reforms that strengthened the power of the prince and promoted meritocracy in the army and bureaucracy, it attacked Zhao and succeeded in taking its capital, but was finally forced to give it back after Qi intervened to calm the expansionist desires of the other states. Wei, now allied with Zhao, then attempted to conquer the Han, but was once again repulsed at the Battle of Maling following Qi's intervention. This defeat was a catastrophe for Wei, whose army was wiped out in the battle, putting an end to its golden age. In parallel, it's another state that's gaining in importance, even though it's been very discreet until now. From 350 onwards, the state of Qin was gradually modernized. This modernization was largely due to the reforms carried out by Shang Yang, Qin's chancellor, between 360 and 340. Shang Yang divided the territory into 41 prefectures, unified weights and measures, encouraged agricultural production by exempting peasants whose harvests exceeded a certain quantity of grain from drudgery, and launched major works to irrigate state lands and greatly increase agricultural production. But above all, he abolished the titles and privileges of the nobility, who were too weak and too poor to oppose him. To replace them, he created 20 degrees of nobility for those who had distinguished themselves in war. These titles were awarded according to the number of heads cut off by the enemy, the upper echelons of the army were no longer reserved for the nobility, and anyone with the requisite skills could now claim the title of general. It also profoundly reorganized society, requiring peasant communities to organize themselves into groups of five to ten families. These families were collectively responsible and had to denounce each other if a crime was committed. This new organization of peasant life was part of a reorganization of the army, since the state drew its troops from peasant communities, which became professional, disciplined, and well-trained. Shang Yang also distinguished himself in battle. After Wei's defeat at the hands of Qi, he intervened and seized the territories west of the Wei. These reforms, which laid the foundations for administration in China, propelled Qin to the forefront, its economy flourished, and, with each conquest, its regular army grew to several hundred thousand men, perhaps even exceeding one million by the end of the period. Qin's newfound strength enabled him to launch campaigns against his neighbors. In 328, he first repelled nomadic barbarians south of his borders. In 316, he seized the province of Chengdu from Chu. And in 308, he completed the securing of the lands to the south. In the east, Chu crushed the armies of Wei and Yue before annexing the latter. But this campaign greatly depleted the state's resources. Some time later, the Wei and Han states, worried by the Qin's growing power, joined forces to crush it. But the latter's outnumbered army managed to defeat its enemies at the Battle of Yikui. The investigator of this victory and of the ensuing campaign was Bai Qi, a Qin general who is considered in Chinese tradition never to have suffered defeat. Unfortunately, Qin was forced to surrender his conquests when the Kingdom of Qi threatened to raise a coalition against him. In 286, the states of Qi, Chu and Wei joined forces to invade the tough Song Kingdom. The King of Qin, who was allied with the Song, was enraged when he heard the news. A few years later, he took advantage of a rumor to form a coalition against Qi. This coalition, made up of Zhao, Yan, Han, Wei, Chu and Qin, reduced the country to ashes, and Qi never really recovered from this war. 
In 265, Qin launched an invasion of Han to seize the province of Shangdang. The war quickly turned in Qin's favor, but the king of Han, refusing to let the province fall into his hands, offered Shangdang to the king of Zhao. The latter then sent his army to defend it, and the war bogged down for three years, but in 260, after General Bai Qi had taken control of Qin's troops, Zhao's forces were finally defeated. Legend has it that Bai Qi had the 400,000 survivors of Zhao's army buried alive, but in any case, with this victory and the ruin of Zhao, Qin got rid of his last competitor, so it's clear that he now has military supremacy in China. A few years later, Qin conquered the stronghold of the Zhou kings, putting a definitive end to the symbolic kingship of their dynasty. In 246, finally, King Zheng rides on the Qin throne. He was only 13 at the time and had to undergo a regency from his chancellor. He took over the reins of the country in 238, after ousting his chancellor, and marked the end of the period of the Warring Kingdoms with the start of his campaigns in 230. The Han Kingdom is the first to be annexed. He surrendered without a fight. Most of Zhao was then conquered in 228, and following an assassination attempt on King Zheng, Yan was also conquered in 226. The following year, it was Wei's turn to lay down his arms after the fall of his capital, leaving Chu as Qin's last serious opponent. In 223, a campaign was launched against Chu but failed, followed by a second victorious campaign. The war against Chu was surely the conflict of the period that saw the greatest number of men clash, with hundreds of thousands of soldiers meeting in battle between these states. Finally, Qi allowed itself to be annexed without a fight in 221, thus completing Qin's conquests and the unity of the Chinese world. In the end, it was Qin, a state built on the lands of barbarians, far removed from the purity of China's central states, that was able to unify this world. A unification that culminated in a dazzling succession of conquests that lasted less than 10 years, but took more than 500 years to prepare. It took hundreds of years to go from the decentralized kingdom of the Zhou a confederation of principalities with shifting loyalties to the Chinese Empire, a centralized state based on bureaucracy. As the next two millennia of Chinese history began, King Zheng decided to reign not as King of Qin, but as Emperor, becoming Qin Shi Huangdi, the first of China's 400-plus rulers.